Good morning, everybody. Uh, we'll start here in a couple minutes. All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining our webinar here today. Uh, I'm Kyle Nelson, the Vice President of Business Development here at Jellicos. And uh, again, we appreciate your time. Uh, we know everybody's got plenty of things going on in their lives right now. We appreciate you taking a couple hours of it to spend it with us. Topic today is application modernization. Um, this is our first webinar on application modernization, typically this uh, seminar is something that we do in person, but under the circumstances, we uh, we wanted to make sure that we offered this this type of webinar to as many people as we could so that we can continue to reinforce the message. Um, real quick, before we start, everyone will be muted, um, but we do want to make this as interactive as possible. So um, leave your comments and questions in the in the chat tab. And we'll make sure to monitor it and, and answer your questions as we go forward. Um, we'll also be sending out the links uh, to the presentation, um, as well as some credits for some hands on labs that you can do later, um, kind of self paced on your own. Um, and we'll also include our contact information. So if you do have any questions while you're doing the labs, you can reach out to us and we'll be happy to help. Um, and then we are including a survey at the end of this uh, webinar. So if you would just take a few minutes and fill that out for us, we'd really appreciate it. So let me get started here with, with what the schedule will look like this morning. Um, first of all, we'll go through application modernization in general and not only some very specific methodologies around application modernization, but also how Jellicos has been able to leverage application modernization with AWS and our customers. And that session will be led by Leon Thomas, who is our CTO here at Jellicos. And then the latter part of the webinar will be uh, a lab demo and it will be introduction to uh, Amazon API Gateway. And that will be done by Carlos Fernandez, who is a solutions architect here at Jellicos, and Paul Delaria, who is our partner solutions architect who works, works for AWS. So um, we'll get those two parts done. And at the very end, uh, we'll do a quiz. We, we typically do this when we're face to face and it's a pretty fun little uh, little quiz that we do and uh, there will be prizes for those people that answer uh, the questions correctly. So um, without further ado, uh, I'm going to jump into a quick overview of who Jellicos is so that people have a better understanding um, of, of our, us as a company. So um, Jellicos is an AWS advanced tier consulting partner focused in the central region um, of the US. And we work with our customers to help them plan out and execute their migration from on-prem or data centers into AWS. Um, we are AWS exclusive and we focus strictly on AWS so that our customers feel like we're absolutely dedicated to making sure that their success is 100% um, satisfactory and that they're getting the most out of their migration to the cloud. Jellicos in general has been in business uh, since the year 2000, so we're coming up on 20 years um, and have really spent a lot of our time working not only on migrations to data centers and, and now to AWS exclusively, but we also have a very deep application 
group. And, and that's where this application modernization methodologies come from. Um, as I said, uh, as an AWS advanced tier consulting partner, one of the keys for us is to make sure that when we're providing uh, migration resources to our customers, that we want to make sure we're providing the top level talent that we have in our organization to those customers. And therefore, we, we carry quite a few different accreditations, certifications, um, both associate level within AWS, as well as professional level certification in AWS as well. And, you know, first and foremost, at the end of the day, what, what we try to focus on with our customers is to, to focus on the business first and technology second. So let me walk to the next slide and I'll, I'll kind of walk you through how, how we work with our customers. This slide here is one that we talk to our customers pretty regularly about, and that is the, the cloud stages of adoption. And through this cloud stages of adoption, uh, Jellicos has very specific productized service offerings that we deploy at our customers to help them get started and, and build the right framework around AWS from a best practices perspective, all the way into full migration, and then what we call cloud ops, which is our managed services and support offering. So, you know, at the end of the day, if you look at this, this uh, chart here with value on, on the left side and time on the right, um, the time factor for us when we're talking to customers is really up to them. How quickly or slowly do they wanna go through this migration uh, phase? So we typically start out with kind of looking at uh, AWS as a solution as people are moving from data centers to the cloud. Um, in that foundational piece, what we do is we, we have a service offering called Jumpstart. And that is our very uh, pristine best practices driven AWS landing zone that needs to be built up front so that customers can take advantage of all of the key services within AWS and build in some security and compliance uh, resilience so that they have all of that done before they do a whole lot of migrations. Uh, once we get to that um, next step around migration, we start looking at ways to help customers um, either go cloud native uh, or start to retire some of the tech debt um, that might be in their current IT organization. And so as we're going through the migration phase, we're constantly looking for ways to help our customers uh, reduce their IT spend, but also gain the efficiency, the productivity, the performance that comes with, with AWS. And, and as I said, once we've assisted our customers in getting to the cloud, then we have services that we can continue to help them uh, manage, monitor, and optimize both cost and technology in their AWS environment. Some of the two, the, the two things at the bottom are, are really important. We, we do um, emphasize with our customers that they should have uh, laser focus on this effort. And, and what we recommend is that they build a cloud center of excellence um, to help govern and drive the activities to get them from where they are today into um, a, a more cloud ready state. And we follow the AWS cloud adoption framework and there, there are very specific delivery kits that go with that to help make sure that everything that we're doing in conjunction with our customers um, is done from a best practices perspective. Next slide, please. So at this point, um, uh, again, I appreciate your time. Uh, we're gonna try to keep this to, to the two hour mark. Um, I'd like to introduce Leon Thomas, who is our CTO to walk you through the application modernization piece of the webinar. Great, thanks Kyle. I uh, appreciate the, the intro um, and thank you all for, for joining us today. I wanted to go through a, a quick agenda here. Um, most importantly, just give you a, a face to go with the, the name and the voice, and then we'll be focusing on the deck. I'm gonna go pretty quick um, some of these slides, but let's do a quick uh, a poll, and then we'll hit service terminology overview to kind of get everybody on the same page. Look at some of the different common migration patterns that are out there. Um, we'll touch a little bit on serverless, uh, just because it fits into that kind of the, the final bullet there, the strangler pattern migration strategy. Um, so with that, I'll let uh, the, the poll take over and I'll go ahead. You'll, you should see that on the, there's just a couple of questions that will help us kind of tailor the, the conversation. You should see that on pop up on your screen. We'll give you just a minute or two to do that.
one of the things we like to do um, when we, we give this, this talk is try to tailor to the level of experience that the, the audience has. Um, we've been in situations where we literally have had a large portion of the group that that, that hasn't even logged into an AWS console, and we've got other organizations that are, are, are pretty well versed. And looks like we've got all the the most of the answers back now, and we've got kind of a um, a mix. So we've got about forty percent of you that have dabbled a little, and about forty percent of you that have uh, run for their run production workloads, and we've got uh, the remainder that don't have any AWS experience. Um, so that helps. Thanks for giving me just kind of some insight there into to where we're where we're headed. Um, with that, I'll dive right into the AWS service and terminology overview. Uh, I am gonna, as I mentioned, try to, to keep this within the time constraints uh, and and go through some of this stuff somewhat rapidly. I'm happy to answer any questions in any more depth, um, kind of after that we we get through the program um, and. As Kyle mentioned, feel free to, to pop our question into the chat and we can make this a, a, a little more interactive if at all possible. Um, so again, without further ado, we'll, we'll dive in. So one of, the, one of the main things we want to talk about in terms of a level set for, for terminology is making sure that some of the, the basic terms um, are, are understood and, and as we use them, um, you're, you're getting a reference point. Uh, some of you that are running production workloads, this is a, is a pretty remedial thing. Some of you that are, are brand new, um, you'll hear this, this stuff over and over again. But this slide's just a, a quick picture of the AWS global infrastructure. You know, a few terms that, that are relevant here, you'll hear your regions, uh, which is exactly that, a geographical region collection of data, data centers. Uh, avail availability zones, which you can think of as kind of fault domains within those data center clusters, uh, and then the actual edge locations, which are kind of synonymous with on ramps to the AWS backbone. As you can Leon, see, hey Leon, real quick, um, I'm getting some comments in. Can you maybe adjust your mic a little bit? It's cutting out occasionally. Sure. Okay, thank you. Let me, uh, let me just make sure. Is that any better? Uh, yeah, you may want to keep keep talking. I'll keep monitoring it. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Let me know if I need to switch. I've got a couple that, different options. That seems, that seems better. Okay. Great. Um, so this is a, again an overall picture of the the global infrastructure, um, mostly focused on terminology here. Um, this is an example of how the availability zones fit in into the regions. Um, just a kind of r random trivia item here, the, the region or the availability zones are, are named you know, A, B, and C. Th those are not actually tied to specific availability zones. Those are issued out as round, round robin to make sure those loads are distributed. Um, so little, again, a little bar trivia for those of you that are uh, getting super technical while enjoying a beverage. This is a, um, a bit of a an eye chart and the purpose of this isn't necessarily to go through or have it represent all of the different services. Um, but I, I think the main thing to consider here is when, when people hear AWS, they think of storage and compute. Um, and we're really just, it's, it's a collection of individual services under that umbrella. Um, at last count, I think the number is 217, um, but it changes uh, uh, pretty rapidly. So. Um, again, main, main concept here is a collection of services that you can leverage to help you kind of facilitate your, your cloud adoption and get the most value. Um, moving along, um, one of the things that uh, we'll reference a lot in, in talking about different architectures are uh, some of the items that we have here. This is just a diagram of a typical three-tier uh, architecture. On the left, you've got storage and S3 buckets. In the middle is a common concept here we call uh, VPC, virtual private cloud. Um, you've got your three tiers um, tying to internet gateway, VPC endpoint. And again, I'll, we'll, we'll get into this in a little bit more detail, but just a sample representation for those of you that haven't seen that in the past. Um, EC2 is the one of the more common terms that you'll hear. Um, 
for those of you that are new, that's essentially a virtual machine. Uh, what starts as an AMI, Amazon Machine Image, um, which is then deployed as an instance, which is deployed into a virtual private cloud um, that is within an availability zone, can be deployed across multiple availability zones. Those availability zones are with a re in a region. Those EC2 instances or virtual machines are connected to, to Elastic Block Storage, um, which is then uh, moved into potentially S3 buckets as, as snapshots and maybe even a, a different availability zone. So there's a number of ways to uh, um, accomplish this, but at a very high level, that's uh, an overview. An another concept that's important to understand um, is the, the, the idea of instance families. And these are different types of EC2 instances that are optimized for a specific area. So this is just a, an overview, but you've got uh, general purpose, which would be, you know, tr traditional uh, mul multifunction workloads, uh, compute optimized, storage and IO optimized, GPU and memory. The, the point of this slide is that you have a really wide array of, of, of options to provide the best performance at the lowest possible cost. Um, it creates a different kind of a mindset as you're looking at, at application um, performance optimization. Um, we won't go through all of these, but the, these are individual um, different types of storage offerings that AWS provides. Um, and this is a, a, a major strength of AWS in, in the hyperscale world, just because of the, the granularity with it in which you can choose this, the, the storage option that you have. Um, this is a, just an example of the different things that we consider when we're, we're recommending or architecting a solution, a solution. You think about, you know, durability in terms of, you know, how many nines, if we lose data, um, shouldn't say that, availability, how many nines, durability, um, can we lose any data, um, security, what, what types of, of security measures can we utilize, uh, we look at cost, of course, always a factor. Um, how fast can we scale? Um, performance being a big component, and then the different methods with, within which you can interact with the, the data. Um, like here again, we won't talk a lot about storage, but the, the general premise is just understanding that there are significant number of options. And you know, one of the things we like to do is, is step through these processes to help you choose the ones that fit the best. Uh, so with all that sort of terminology overview out of the way, we can dive into um, kind of the core here. You know, one of the, the things that we're focused on is um, uh, the strangler pattern. We'll kind of talk about how that fits with other um, patterns. I'm going to spend a little time talking about migration drivers. You know, why would people uh, migrate? A little time talking about where this becomes sticky, so the problem space that we're dealing with. Um, current strategies that are out there that people are, are using and are kind of commonplace. Um, again, talk a little bit about serverless and then move into the, the actual strangler pattern. So the, the drivers component, um, I like to spend a little time on this slide to help people understand, um, you know, some of the, the, the ways we look at um, the business case. Um, and if you start kind of just on the, the top left here, the agility and, de and dev productivity, um, this is an item that we feel pretty strongly um, it doesn't get an, enough attention. Um, and in large part, that's because a lot of organizations aren't measuring this now. Um, so if you look at, you know, agility and development productivity and you talk about metrics like, like, like cycle time and number of releases, um, most of your traditional IT organizations aren't measuring things like cycle time. Um, cycle time being the amount of time essentially between uh, from when a feature is, is re requested slash approved to be incorporated into an application and the time it's actually released. Um, one of the main benefits of moving to a cloud solution that enables you to do things like continuous integration and continuous delivery is you're able to significantly improve cycle time. Um, so that agility and ability to spin things up and, and, and uh, tear things down very, very quickly allows you to move faster, uh, lower time to, to value, 
Um, again, it, it's a significant driver from, from our, in our experience, um, but doesn't always get the, the it's, it's due um, uh, attention, if you will. Um, moving along to the right here, data center consolidation. Uh, this one's pretty obvious. You know, we work with a lot of organizations that either have multiple data centers they've acquired through acquisition or maybe through just data center sprawl in general. Um, pretty, pretty solid business case, but pretty self-explanatory. Uh, digital transformation, a little bit more of a, um, you know, a, a, a broad term, uh, if you will, kind of an industry buzzword that means a lot of things to a lot of organizations, but, you know, overall, um, it really fits into a transformation strategy because it enables you to make some process changes and, and speed things up. And in my mind, ties, ties very closely back to the agility and development productivity uh, side of things. Um, cost reduction is an important one. Um, the, it's, this is an item that um, kind of determines the, the direction of the conversation and the business case. You know, one of the things that's really important to us is understanding why someone wants to adopt cloud. Uh, if we walk into that room and, and the, the answer is cost reduction, that's a very different conversation than if the answer is we need to be, we need to be more agile or, or more productive. Not that it's any less valid of a conversation, um, but one of the things that it's important to, to help people understand is what that cost um, structure looks like or that profile. Um, and you, you, you look at, I mean, if you think about the concept of moving uh, applications, legacy or, or otherwise into to cloud, there's, there's generally speaking not a light switch that you get to shut off during that process. So for a period of time, you've got um, not only duplicate costs around your infrastructure potentially, but you've also got you know, additional resources that you're investing in, in making that transition happen. Um, so while again, cost reduction is, is important and very valid, I think it's as important for the organization to understand what that profile looks like when they enter into um, in any type of cloud adoption initiative. Um, running along the bottom, quick acquisitions or divestitures, um, kind of ties into data center consolidation, but, but also um, any type of divestiture um, makes for a pretty good opportunity to, to spin things off. Um, large scale compute intensive workloads. So clearly one of the benefits of cloud adoption is the ability to spin up and, and, and scale up and, and, and scale down very, very quickly. Um, creates a very attractive business case as it relates to um, you know, cost structure and avoiding so of CapEx to build that infrastructure. Um, the next two kind of tie, tie together, you know, facility or real estate decisions and co-location or outsourcing contract changes. You know, if you've got a contract coming up or if you're looking at moving office buildings um, or building, do you, do you build out data center space, do you not? Um, these are pretty easy business cases to talk through, um, you know, especially when you look at the contract changes, you have a very finite end date and um, oftentimes those, those decisions are, are pretty straightforward. Um, okay, so with that, let's get into the, the problem space a little bit that we're trying to tackle around app modernization. Um, and really, we want to just look at some some key areas that that come to you know into the equation when we're looking at the business case. Um, and when you look at when you're when you're dealing with legacy applications, you know one of the important things that we always look look at is the operational cost. So, you know that that is hard cost, but it's also soft cost of admin and care and feeding. Uh, workforce productivity, another one that you know kind of ties into that agility piece. This one sometimes is is tough to measure, um, but when you think about things like cycle times, um, it it starts to become a little more clear where the value is there. Um, cost avoidance is pretty straightforward. You know, maybe uh, you've got a, a, a infrastructure refresh that is coming up, or maybe an application rearchitecture to add scale or features or functionality. Um, that's a big one that, that again, is pretty straightforward around uh, how you quantify that. Um, operational resilience, when you start looking at um, running an application in cloud, the whole concept of disaster recovery and um, just general business continuity changes just because there are so many different ways or tools um, that you can leverage uh, to improve your, your continuity and your resiliency. Um, posture. We'll talk about those a little bit as we as we go through the 
um, the architecture here. And business agility, that's the, the scale up, scale down stuff that we've already talked about um, and really getting things to market quickly, um, which ultimately results in time, time to value reduction. So how, how fast can we get that new feature, that new application to market um, in a cloud-based world versus a, a legacy application? Um, some of those are, are tougher to, to quantify, but um, a solid business case takes into consideration uh, time to value as well. And this is a, you know, more of an informational slide of, you know, what, what does an, a legacy application look like? And, you know, when we think of legacy applications, we think of monolithic architectures, you know, three tier typical architecture. Um, and the, the purpose of this slide is, is really um, more than anything, just to say that they take on all shapes and sizes. Uh, so if you think of, you know, Java and COBOL making up a, a disproportionately large, the rest is kind of a smattering that's all over the place. Um, and then, you know, on, on the right, for, for those of you that still use uh, lines of the, the archaic lines of code uh, measurement within your organization to determine application size, uh, the point here is that it's, it's kind of all over the board. It doesn't have to be this, this gigantic application that um, that, that needs migrating. Um, it, it can just as easily be a, a smaller application. Um, this is just a quick sample out of uh, a financial services report that was done. Okay, we'll talk a little bit about current strategies that are in place. Um, if you think about, you know, this, this diagram is a, you know, kind of a left to right uh, journey. Um, we look at a, at the six R's they're called in the in the industry and, and today we're going to spend primarily time talking about lift and shift, which is the rehost pathway. You know, if you follow that left to right, you've got the termin termination of the migration path. Um, all right, we, we're going to lift and shift it, and then we determine whether it's manual or automate, automated uh, migration. There are a number of different tools out there that can be leveraged. There are a number of different reasons why you might choose one versus another or, or not at all. Um, but ultimately you end up down at that validation transition and then, then switch to production. We're gonna talk a little bit about re-architecture too across the bottom. Um, re-architecture is, you know, we're, we're very careful to, to not use the term rewrite within most organizations. That generally conjures up uh, uh, conversations about or images of very high cost, low, low return. Um, high time uh, type things. And we'll talk about where that, that fits, but there's some benefits of taking that route as well. Um, what we won't spend any time on today are some of the other items like uh, repurchase, um, which is simply finding another way to, to buy it. So maybe you go from on-prem to a you know, vendor cloud or SaaS type offering or um, retain revisit. Maybe it's a, an application that is being sunset over X period of time and it really doesn't justify any additional investment. And then probably my favorite one is retire and decommission. And on average, when we look at a portfolio of workloads for an organization, there's usually about 10% of things that you can just shut off. Um, pretty pretty uh, significant and clear cut cost savings there. I'm usually surprised at, at what exists out there that, that can be retired pretty quickly. Um, moving right into the, the rehost or the, the lift and shift, um, or we, we like to call it lift shift optimize, which is a slight variation. Um, and this is a really, um, this is a really often used strategy. Um, we caution organizations on this strategy uh, about lift shift and forget um, only because that's when you can run into some uh, you know, decreased value around you know, not only cost, but, but also performance and, and some of those resiliency things that, um, that we were talking about before. Um, one of the reasons you might do this, we'll, we'll see this in a minute here, but one of the reasons you might do this is if you've got a you know, pending deadline, like a contract end or something along those lines. And then on the right, you just, that, that's just a, um, a different representation of, of what you saw in the, the six R's, R's diagram. Um, really with the, the key ones here, trying to determine if we automate or if we use migration tools, but the rest of it um, fits that, that traditional migration pattern. 
Um, when we look at the, the drivers, if you will, or the, the consideration factors, um, this is a, a quick representation of, of how the, the rehost uh, model fits into the equation. So if you think about operational costs, the benefits are pretty, pretty low because you're, you're kind of, in most cases, doing like, like for like. You can achieve a, maybe a 25 to 30% total cost of, of operation savings here. Um, and I'll point out that we use the term total cost of operations uh, in very deliberately as opposed to total cost of ownership, um, just because there are different um, ingredients in that equation. Uh, so while you can uh, achieve some reduction in operational costs, you, you really don't have the, um, some of the additional flexibility of, of you know, utilizing like a serverless architecture. So we'll talk about that a little bit here too. Workforce, workforce productivity, you know, maybe you're not buying, you're not spending the time on hardware procurement, but, you know, and the bottom line is if you're lifting and shifting uh, virtual servers, you still got to manage those servers. So you're, you're not, you're not changing um, the way that, that a lot of this is, is accomplished. Uh, cost avoidance, high or low depends on, on kind of what your, uh, you know, where you are in your refresh cycles, um, but you still have costs associated with some of the third-party management tools that are in place. Um, you do get some benefits in the operational resilience category just because you can now take advantage of some of the um, availability zone slash regional deployments uh, that gives you the, the ability to, to do some things um, that you couldn't otherwise do um, in a traditional data center environment. Um, business agility. Not a lot changes here. Um, a lot of your release processes stay the same, um, but it's easy. You still kind of have to to maintain those pre-production environments the way you did before. And then time to value is is high. That's your main benefit here. And I mentioned uh, earlier, you've got um, you know data center consolidation or or co-location contract uh, timelines. Um, this makes it makes it uh, a pretty attractive option. The re-architecture uh, strategy is, you know, again, kind of looking at, you know, how do we take advantage of some of the cloud native capabilities? Um, and if you see the differentiators in the path to a right there, um, you're really looking at redesigning the application um, and the overall architecture of the application. One of the things I'll, I'll, I'll pull out is, or call out here is the, the full, you know, application lifecycle management or SDLC software development lifecycle opportunity and the integration opportunity. So those of you that are on the application side, um, you know, CICD uh, type capabilities, those of you on the infrastructure side, um, you know, infrastructure as code becomes an opportunity here um, that really can improve agility and, and increase productivity. Um, one of the reasons you might choose re-architecture uh, is, you know, the, the ability to add features that um, maybe are, are more cumbersome to add to a legacy application or a monolithic application. Um, maybe you need to scale very rapidly or maybe you're just running into performance challenges that, you know, the old traditional way of doing it would be to, to throw hardware at it. Um, so there's, there's some different opportunities here. And if we, if we look at the comparison of, um, you know, the rehost strategy versus the re-architecture strategy, you know, your operational cost benefits are high um, potentially with 90% uh, reduction in total cost of operations. Um, we can talk through that uh, in detail, but for the um, you know, purposes of keeping this in the window, um, we'll kind of just glaze over that today. Um, workforce, workforce productivity is important. Um, really, you're, you're focusing on high value items and not in what we call high undifferentiated, undifferentiated heavy lifting. Um, cost avoidance, high here, uh, no hardware refresh, no maintenance, no, no management tools. Um, operational resilience, um, your resilience is, is based on the AWS infrastructure architecture. Um, so significant improvements or benefits there. Business agility is high. Um, if you're using things like uh, uh, infrastructure as code, um, if you have some specific data sovereignty requirements, um, the ability to deploy into new regions um, and deploy very infrastructure very, very quickly um, is, is significantly enhanced. And then 
um, you know, the ding here is time to value is, is low, um, tends to be the, the highest uh, amount of, of resource intensity um, and also has the, you know, the biggest long-term impact, but it, it takes time to, to get there. So to, to summarize those, those six R's that we talked about um, kind of side by side, um, you know, on the left here, we have effort, time, and cost kind of increasing, increasing as you go. Um, and then the opportunity to optimize also increasing as you go. Um, further down that, that list you go, the, the more complex the migration effort generally is. We lost your mic again. Sorry. Did you get me back there? Yeah, no. got you. Thank you. Okay. Yep. Okay, so let's let's talk a little bit about um, serverless architecture, and and the the point here isn't to talk or discuss all things serverless as as much as it is just make sure uh, everybody has a base understanding of what we mean when we say serverless architecture. So we're going to do just a, a high level overview. Um, you know, if, if you think about it, the the most basic way to describe it is. Uh, serverless is simply building and running applications without thinking about the servers. I mean, as, as IT professionals, we all know that there's still actually servers behind the scenes. Um, so the, the name kind of um, is, is obviously a little bit of a, a play on it, but essentially um, we're talking about simply not having to think about those as we, as we deploy an application. If you look at the, the evolution of compute, you know, we started with physical data, servers in the data centers, and then we move to virtual servers and data centers. Then the next logical step was virtual servers in the cloud or in AWS world, you know, EC2 instances. Um, you know, each time we made, made a step in this evolution, it, we, we improve, right? So when we move to, uh, um, you know, virtual servers, we got better utilization. We could provision things faster. We have more uptime because we can, can take advantage of of, of cluster technology a little easier. Um, DR got better because of the tools and the mobility. Um, hardware independence, we really didn't care what we were throwing underneath that from, for the most part. When we moved to virtual servers in the cloud, we got to trade CapEx for OpEx. We had significantly more scale, um, the ability to scale up and down, um, faster speed, uh, less maintenance, better availability, fault tolerance, all the things that we talked about as some of those, those business drivers. The challenge is, you know, when you, when you look at the, um, the the drawbacks or the or the things that remain, you know, we still need to admin uh, in that first step. We still still need to manage capacity and utilization. We still need to, to do um, you know capacity planning exercises and 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 DR exercises that are are relatively cumbersome, um, and it's it's tough to scale up and run uh, batch jobs where you've got um, to build for your peak utilization, right? So the next next logical step is that evolution to, to, to serverless. And, you know, the really, if you think about it, um, you know, one of the most basic ways to, to say this is no, no server is easier to manage than no server. Um, so it takes away all that provisioning and utilization. Uh, takes away the, the the planning for fault tolerance and availability, your scale and your operations management. And when we when we say serverless in an AWS world, um, you know we we oftentimes people will reference Lambda, which is the the, the logo symbol you see on the on the right there. Um, it's actually a, a broader array. Um, Lambda kind of becomes the poster child for serverless compute. Um, but there are several categories of serverless compute that you know, we won't, there's a whole portfolio of serverless that uh, um, offerings or options that, that AWS brings to the table. Um, but today we're going to focus a little bit on, on Lambda. We'll also talk a little bit about um, some serverless database services that, that are, are offered like relational database services or RDS. Um, one of the main components of, of Serverless is that it's another term that you might hear is event-driven or step computing. 
um, continuous ability to, to scale. So, so Lambda will, will scale up and down based on the number of invocations you need to meet your performance requirements. And then another um, you know, an important pillar of, of, of serverless is you, you pay by usage. So you're never paying for idle time. Um, you're only paying for what you need. Um, we talked a little bit in that, that prior slide about um, you know, the, the scaling component goes down and the operations or get goes away or operations and management goes away. You know, I'm all, always a little cautious at this juncture of, of saying that that completely goes away. It, it, you know, one of the things we like to say is it shifts um, and it shifts to, the, to largely the development team. And that, that development team has to think about things like the efficiency of their code. If you're paying by usage and you've got a particular function within your application that takes two seconds to run versus 10 seconds to run, that's just, that can be a significant impact in a high volume application uh, to cost. So um, while yes, it, it, it takes a lot of that, that, that optimization and capacity planning um, out of the equation, uh, there are some new things that are, are worth thinking about as you, you know, as you look at uh, you know, optimizing that application for, for both performance and, and, uh, and cost. So with that, let's, let's talk a little bit about the, the Strangler pattern um, specifically. And there's probably a few of you that are on the call that, that have uh, utilized the Strangler pattern. So we'll go through this at a high level and then we're gonna talk through kind of what an actual monolithic migration would, would look like. Um, and let's see here. So the, the origin of the, the concept of, of the Strangler pat pattern is actually, um, you know, based on the, the Strangler tree, um, which is a, a series of branches that, that over time makes its way around the actual trunk of an existing tree and then essentially sucks the, nu the nutrients out of that, that tree to the point where it, it eventually um, completely crumbles away and what's left in the middle uh, is a new standing tree in its, in its, uh, in its spot. Uh, so to, to kind of play on the, you know, where some of this thought process came from, um, this is a, just a quote from, from ThoughtWorks, um, Martin Fowler talked about the you know strangler patterns basically an alternative route to to create a new system around the edges of the old so over time you're 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 migrating and then you're building um, around the edges of that application ultimately until the old system is strangled in in this world he's referencing several years uh, it could be a number of um, different uh, options in terms of how fast or, or slow the organization can move. It also depends a little bit on how, how complex the system is, um, which we'll talk a little bit about here. Hey, Leon, we have a quick question on chat. Um, sure. Are you seeing organizations that are concerned about AWS lock-in uh, when re-architecting an application? And if so, are there uh, migration techniques around that? Yeah, really, really good question and a really common one. Um, and I think, I think the, the the answer is yes. We see organizations that are are concerned about lock in, um, but when what we've found is in many situations, and I'll, I'll say not all, but in many situations, some of the benefits you get from utilizing um, cloud native services, um, you know, versus doing something like containerization. Uh, for portability or, or avoiding that, that, that lock-in um, often outweigh some of the drawbacks. So we work with organizations that are, are doing app mod and, and we talk a lot about vendor lock-in. We also work with organizations that you would consider cloud native or, or born in the cloud. And when you talk to some of the cloud native organizations, there's one relatively large cloud native organization that we work with that, um, you know, when they get asked this question, you know, they say, we, you know, time and time again, we've done the math, and even if we had the rip replace, the sheer utility that we get and the performance gains that we get by using cloud native outweigh what that what that rip and replace or re-architecture model would be. That's going to be different for every 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 organization um, or every migration case, but 
Uh, I think it's a valid concern, one that people could, should talk about. Um, you know, if you want to avoid it, you're you're almost always going to do some sort of containerization if you want to get to um, you know the uh, true modernization. I think the only the only wrong answer is what I alluded to um, you know, early early on, and is if you do a, a lift shift and forget, and if you if you do that in the name of of you know avoiding vendor lock in. You're, in in our view, you're you're kind of missing the um, the boat on the, the value that you could get from a, a modernization or a, a, a migration exercise. You may need to adjust your mic again, Leon. It is crackling. Sorry. That's all right. I appreciate the feedback. I'm flipping back and forth, and it seems like uh, <laughs> um, one's working better than the other. Okay. Thanks for the response. Thanks for the question, Scott. So we're going to dive into a, a, an actual architectural um, example here. And we're, we're going to start by essentially combining the concepts of, of rehost and uh, re-architect in our, our strangler pattern. So on the left, we've got our, our typical monolithic application that you know, maybe lives in a, a corporate data center. Um, and on the right, we have the, the resulting architecture in a, a rehost. And I'll just talk through, you know, some of the changes that we made that, that gave us some immediate value. Um, so in this rehost that we did, we did a couple of, of uh, important things. So if you look at the you know, kind of starting from the user perspective and moving down, we've, we've added an elastic load balance um, service on the, on the front here. This is a, um, um, a, a completely managed service, very straightforward, very simple to deploy. What that allows us to do is distribute our traffic uh, across different availability zones very easily, um, very cost effectively. You know, if you compare and contrast this to, you know, a traditional um, addition of load balance environment, or even if you're migrating your monolithic application from a load balance environment, you think about, you know, the the iron that you've got to have in front of that to, to add that load balancing capability. But what we've been able to do here is we add the load balancer, we distribute that traffic across multiple availability zones. So we went ahead and just lifted and shifted our, our web and application layer. And we did that as, as EC2 instances. So individual virtual machines, we've put those groups put in two separate availability zones. And then we've added a concept called auto scaling groups. So an auto scaling group essentially gives you the ability to provision more of these EC2 instances based on almost any metric that you want. So whether that is, you know, time-based, so we're going to spin more of these up to, to handle a batch process or to handle, a, um, you know, some seasonality, or whether that's metric based on, on you know, CPU utilization or you know, even response times. Uh, there's there's a, a, a number of ways that you can architect this to gain some pretty significant value here. Um, without uh, incurring significant cost. And then down in the database layer, um, we, we did something else. We took our, our, our database environment down here, which may have been you know, Oracle, SQL, uh, MySQL, whatever, whatever flavor um, was, was present. And we just did a straight state migration into a serverless uh, RDS. So what that enables us to do is freeze us up from a lot of the management tasks of the, the database layer. And then we can also do synchronous replication very quickly. And now all of a sudden we've got a read replica standby. So if you think about things like um, SQL server and availability groups um, and some of the challenges associated with deploying those correctly, um, that literally gets reduced to, to a checkbox in this in, in environment, thereby you know, further increasing our resiliency, but then increasing some of the capabilities we have by making a read replica over here, which we'll talk a little bit about in the, the next couple slides. Um, again, just pointing out some of the terminology here as you look at these architectural diagrams on, on the, the full external, we have the AWS environment in general, and then we move into a, the blue is a first blue lines of region, then we've got a virtual private cloud within that region, and then we're stretching that into those individual availability zones or fault domains. Uh, moving right along here, the, the next step that we have is the, the introduction of the API gateway. So 
what this allows us to do is have really um, granular visibility into the um, traffic that's coming into our application. And you know, for, for kind of the, the purposes of you know, painting the picture here, our, our, our application is a, a banking application, so think consumer banking. Um, and all that comes into play when we get into some of the traffic patterns here in a minute. Um, but all we've done is deployed this API gateway, which is something that that uh, Paul and, and, and Carlos are going to demonstrate for you and talk a little bit about. This is a very simple process, very straightforward. Um, this this slide shows you know kind of the, the core steps. Um, we're literally hitting a, a, a button that says create API. Um, we've got the ability to do some some basic scripting. Um, and then when we look at you know the the different options that we have, we can, push this uh, traffic to a Lambda function. In this case, we're just doing an HTTP pass through. Um, also another sort of development slash agility component, we can build an API and, and stub it out very quickly by just making it a mock endpoint. Um, it enables you to decouple teams and um, allow for a much faster, removes dependencies and allow for much, develop, much faster development cycles. Push this to an, uh, an additional AWS service. We'll talk a little bit about that. Um, and then in this, again, in this world, we're pushing it through just a, any HTTP method that's available. Um, we just specify our endpoint URL, which is our, our consumer banking application. And that's just our, our, our request URL once our rehost is done. And in this situation, we're just doing a pass through with that, um, that traffic. So again, kind of talking through the, um, the benefits of doing this in this in this next step, um, you know, we've we've taken API Gateway and we and we pushed the, everything to CloudWatch. So it's kind of a cent centralized logging service that's available to all services within AWS. And that allows us to have a very very granular, um, and we can actually do this out of ELB too. But I'll explain why. Um, you know, for those of you that that have um, been around the block block in production, I'll explain why we we did it this way. But in this situation, you know, we're not going to get into the super granular um, explanation of all the traffic patterns. But essentially, what we're we're getting is our ability to understand the number of requests and how long those requests take, um, and that helps us quantify what we're what we're looking for our our, our hot spots. So, in this particular example, um, you know, we're looking at you know we got a, a, a hot spot here that. Um, we're trying to identify and we're able to see that we've got client requests coming in and those those requests are 197 transactions a minute and then from there they're going into these individual requests and this this specific example shows that this this request in the bottom right is is um, the the bulk of the the requests that are coming in or this representation in the bottom right um, so we look at that as a hot spot and and we're able to see that using um, AWS X-Ray, which is uh, enables you to, to to get down into the the actual request that that's being logged, um, and helps us to to um, identify what our next next path is. So in this scenario, we're going to take that that hotspot that we identified, and for the purposes of conversation, we'll 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 just say that this is get balance, right? So what we're seeing here is the vast number of people that are logging in um, are, are going and, and, and checking their balance. So in this, this step, we take that, that function and we are doing a couple of different things here. We're, we're developing that request and we're, we're wrapping that uh, into a Lambda function. So in some cases that code can be, can be ported over. In other cases, you're, you're doing just a, a, a rewrite of that particular function. Um, the other thing that's been done here um, is we've utilized uh, an, another service from AWS called AWS Database Migration Service or DMS. Um, database Migration Service uh, is, is, is pretty poorly named because it it's really has a use case that is, is outside of um, uh, just migration, you know, oftentimes people look at it and just assume, well, that's that's just a, a repl replication tool for me to do in my initial move, but it can actually be used to keep data um, in sync. Um, so in, in this particular case, we've said, okay, um, you know, this get balance function um, would would operate, you know, so we're going to wrap it in our, our, our Lambda um, 
environment here. And then we're going to say, you know, that SQL or Oracle or whatever we're using over here in, in our RDS is, is awesome for a portion of the application, but the ideal fit for this type of request might be Amazon Dynamo DB, um, which is a you know, more of a key value pair type approach. So a performance optimized. Um, in this particular case, we're doing read only, so the database migration is, is, is pretty straightforward. Database migration service is pretty straightforward. And ultimately, um, we're going to use that to keep that, that, that data in sync. Um, one of the key considerations, you know, from a, when you think about going from a monolithic application to, um, you know, a serverless application is, is really getting away from that, that concept that we have to build everything on one database and, and shifting your thinking towards what's the right tool for the, the job. And because these are serverless deployments, you know, we, we don't, need to have you know dbas for every single type of database that we're using so it's not uncommon for us to see an application that maybe has four or five different flavors of, of, of database environment um, just simply because it was again the right the right tool for the the job at the time so we've created our our lambda we've we've replicated our data and and now what we're able to do is you know, deploy that that lambda function um, and then ultimately here again, your, your scaling is all um, managed. The number of invocations is going to depend on the amount of traffic and the performance objectives that you've had. Um, one of the key components here is, is this concept called the canary release. And um, many of you may have heard of this, but it's essentially this is the, the whole canary in the coal mine. And this is the reason that we deployed API Gateway um, to begin with. Not only did we want that granularity, but we wanted the ability um, to quickly do this, this canary deployment. So in this particular example, what we've done is we've said, we want to take 10% of our requests every hour, and we're going to move 10% to our new function. And we're going to monitor that and understand, are, are we achieving our performance objectives? Is it uh, behaving as expected? Is the end user experience uh, up to par? Um, but we're still going to maintain about 90% of that um, going back through the, the traditional application. Um, in its in its uh, lift and shift form, um, and that the the canary release process. This is another example of of something that is dramatically simplified um, in in a uh, AWS world. Um, within the the um, API, you can sim simply go through and and, and literally determine uh, the percentage of traffic that you want to direct, uh, and then in the, the far right here, you can see what we've done is rather than taking uh, this as an HTTP pass through, we're pointing it directly to our Lambda function. So as we move down here, we're specifying that consumer bank get balance function that we created earlier. Um, so we're deploying that 10%. And then over time, what you're able to do then is you collect your information um, and you're able to see uh, exactly what the impact was on the performance and the distribution of, of, of traffic. And you're able to understand, you know, again here, did you, did you meet your, your performance objectives, your end user experience? And then what we'll see organizations do is slowly throttle that up um, from 90 on up to make sure that the invocations keep up with the performance requirements. And, and here again, I would, I would reference slash mention the, the cost modeling um, you know, are, are we incurring the, 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 the right amount of cost or the anticipated amount of cost to make this uh, a good business decision to, to, to move to a serverless function? And then once that process is complete, um, you know, essentially it's, it's a wash, rinse, repeat. So for the purposes of, of this presentation, we're not going through a bunch of different examples, but you may have uh, five, you may have 10, you may have 100 different hotspots. And this is where your, um, the software development lifecycle component that I mentioned earlier um, of a re-architect pattern comes into play. Um, one of the questions we often get is, you know, that's, that's interesting, but if I've got 100 hotspots, how do I manage all of that? Um, and, and realistically, if you've got your, your CICD, your, your code pipeline in place, um, that becomes a fully automated process. Um, so it be, it, it's really important that that CI CD process is well thought out so that if you do get into a situation where you have 
a significant um, number of, of hotspots um, that you've moved to, to Lambda functions that you can manage those efficiently and, uh, and effectively. So if you look at the, the other thing that we've done here, so not only are we gonna iterate on our, our Lambda function, um, but in this particular case, we've taken and we've said there are other functions within the application that we believe would benefit from moving to an Aurora database, which is another flavor of, of data, relational database that um, is optimized for speed and, and resiliency um, that, that is deployed on a, you know, an RDS base, can be deployed on an RDS basis also. Um, so in this particular example, what we've done is we've just taken traffic and we've stood up another ELB and another set of EC2 instances, uh, and we're pointing those to, to Aurora to further optimize those requests. Um, so it's another component of, of kind of moving the, the strangler pattern. And you may be you may be iterating on both of these simultaneously. You may have different teams, um, but there's no there's there's not necessarily a, a prescriptive uh, pattern of you've got to do all of your hotspot stuff first before you move to you know all, all any other type of of transaction optimization. So you can mix and match the the order of operations here. Uh, and then ultimately, uh, what you're what you're looking to do is, you know, kind of complete that that strangulation, uh, if you will. And you know what we've what we've done here is we've taken the remaining architecture, and we've moved the, that remaining architecture into retaining the original RDS. So maybe this is still SQL or Oracle, um, and then we've containerized those those previous. Uh, uh, EC2 instances. So we originally had these EC2 instances in an auto scaling group, and we may have an auto scaling group over here too. It just depends on what we're doing. This might maybe this is a batch function that doesn't need that capability. Um, it's low level, um, and ultimately reti retiring that that traditional three tier architecture. Um, so you've kind of got you've got multiple tools in the toolbox here um, to create, uh, you know that 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 complete that overall you know strangler pattern strategy and then finally um, in this example here we've just taken and, and added another API gateway uh, capability to maybe we're communicating directly with the EC2 instances and bypassing um, uh, the, the ELBs for again for maybe it's a performance or a transaction routing um, capability that we're looking at. So to, to summarize, um, what we've what we've got here is you know this original chart that we have. You know we've added the strangler of the six R's. We've ad added the strangler pattern to the to the bottom, and you know, really the to, to simplify this from a, a you know thinking standpoint is you're really combining the the rehost and the rearchitect um, pattern and, or strategies, and you're you're creating an iterative um, not only effort, time, and cost, but an iterative opportunity to to optimize and uh, i'll end with uh i'll kind of wrap this up with a couple of different um, resources that are, are worth reviewing some of these are a little bit dated but the concept is is really still um, relevant uh, and, and you'll get this deck so um you know you don't need to, to jump off to these right now but um this uh, this particular one, the mainframe modernization at AWS is a um, really informative, it talks through kind of what that is. Uh, and then Pivotal Software did a really good talk um, around, you know, sort of that data-driven or hotspot approach. Um, so it's a, another one that, that we find is, is beneficial. Um, so with that, uh, I'll either open it up to questions or I'll turn it over to Kyle to talk a little bit more about some of the programs that are available. Thanks, Leanne. Um, let me take a quick look and make sure that we don't have any additional questions on chat. Looks like we do not. Uh, we'll continue to monitor that as we go forward. Um, real quick, uh, before I hand things over to Carlos and, and Paul, um, just want to, you know, as you look at the about two slides ago, it talked about kind of the um, level of complexity and, and you know, deploying and doing application modernization um, clearly um, is an effort that customers need to take on. 
Um, one of the values of working with an AWS partner like Jellicos is we have access to a lot of these programs that um, can help fund some of those activities for customers so that they're not taking on the, the full financial burden of doing these type of activities. So in this particular case, AWS has provided funding for partners like Jellicos. Clearly as an advanced tier consulting partner, we have to go through quite a, quite a few quality gates to get into that program. And, and as part of that, you get some funding back that can, can help your customers. In this particular case around application modernization, um, we work with our customers uh, and these programs and it helps to offset some of those costs that, that you may have. So again, this information will be provided in the, in the deck that you'll receive. And you know, if there are conversations you or your organization would like to have with us, we're happy to do that. But in, in particular, this is probably one of the most lucrative programs that AWS has, <clears throat> excuse me, that AWS has um, out there today. And the first part of that is um, AWS will help fund 75% of a discovery or, propo or a proposal phase that we would do as part of application modernization. So, um, and that's up to $30,000. So in these cases, when we work with our customers, um, AWS will fund uh, up to 75% of kind of the architecture phase that Jellicos would help with. Um, in addition, if the customer were, was willing to give a reference after the application modernization was complete, um, the AWS would fund up to 50% of what our statement of work would be to help the customer actually do that application modernization. Um, and if the customer were not comfortable giving a reference, it's still pretty lucrative. It's 35% of the um, modernization product statement of work. So um, again, multiple different funding programs when it comes to AWS and different partners. But again, this one is probably the most lucrative in terms of funds that are available for customers as they're going through an application modernization event. So um, if you or your company have any questions or if we can help walk through this in, in ways that we can provide some funding to help offset the costs of doing this, we're happy to do that. All right, so quick check on the chat. Looks like we're still in good shape. Um, we're gonna move next to the lab demo and uh, Carlos, Fernandez, uh, Solutions Architect from Jellicos, and Paul Delaria, who works for AWS and is a partner Solutions Architect. We're going to walk you through the API lab demo, and, uh, and, and we'll start there. So, Carlos, Paul, I'll hand it over to you guys. All right. Yeah, thank you, Kyle. Hello, everyone. Uh, so, um, yeah, my name is Carlos Fernandez. I'm Cloud Solutions Architect with Jellicos. And, and first, I'd like to thank you all for attending uh, this virtual web application modernization event. And thank you, Paul, for, for helping out uh, with this lab demo. Also, I want to remind you uh, that this webinar is being recorded and will be available for yourself or any colleague who wants to watch this later. So uh, we're going to dive into the fun part of, of, of this webinar, and that's actually the AWS console. And, and, and I would like to ask you a question. So Jess, if you would like to have a poll, so I would like to know uh, how familiar are you with the AWS console? Just take a few minutes to answer these questions. I know like we have a, 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 the audience, it's kind of half-half. We have people uh, very familiar with AWS service, services um, and other than not, but I'd like to know uh, how many of you um, have used actually the AWS console. Okay, so we have, um, yeah, we have a lot of people um, that have already used the console, um, just a few people that haven't yet, and that's not a problem at all, because AWS, it's very straightforward. So uh, I also want to point out that in a typical uh, on-site application modernization event or AWS immersion day we have run in the past, 
we typically let the attendees run the labs by themselves um, and then we provide one-on-one -on -one support if needed. But today, because this is not a full day event um, and we might have some challenges providing that one-on-one -on -one, uh, uh, support, so we're gonna run a demo uh, about API Gateway and some other serverless uh, services. But don't feel bad about it. Uh, because I know you want I, uh, you want to get your hands dirty, and we're also going to provide the lab information, and we're going to share some credits with you, so you can run the lab by yourself in a different and separate AWS sandbox account. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, Carlos, maybe I could just add on there. Yeah, go ahead. You know, the great thing about AWS is you know we like to innovate and. Part of innovation with a partner like Jellicos is around experimentation. So we'd also be interested in your feedback uh, here as well, right? You know, what, what is working, what is not working with, with this new format, uh, you know, because the new world we're in is requiring a lot of this uh, virtual world. So we're definitely interested in feedback from you as well. Yeah, thank you, Paul. Um, the other thing I, I will mention is that we have a Paul Jess Anderson, Kyle, uh, monitoring the chat. So if you have any question, feel free and we can dive into it as well. So I have a, a little agenda for, for this lab. Uh, first, uh, I want to talk, uh, let me go ahead and, and probably stop my video here. So uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about the AWS operational responsibility model. Then I, uh, we will talk about the Quip Labs platform and, and how we use this for doing labs. And then we will dive into the demo with API Gateway and Lambda functions. And then we will open the floor to, to the room so to have kind of an answer and question session, if that works for you. Um, so let's get started. So, uh, for, for people that are not familiar with the AWS console or with the AWS public cloud, as Paul mentioned, uh, uh, it's a great opportunity for innovation and, and you have plenty of services. So don't see the cloud as a, a move your virtual VMs on premises to a, a, a normal a three tier monolithic applications on AWS and you can definitely do that and when I see the AWS console, I see a wide spectrum of services that you can leverage for your application. In one side, we have the a virtual private cloud and normal EC2 instances, and that's similar. Uh, so you can, if you use the leaf and shift migration uh, methodology that Leon explained, uh, you, you still need to maintain the operating system, the patching, the antivirus or redundancy of your EC2 instances, but then you can move a little bit to the middle and then you find RDS instances. And as Leon mentioned, uh, uh, you don't need to manage the operating system here or the redundancy or the backup. So AWS provides different flavors of a uh, databases engine and then you will have a fast performance, high availability, all the security will be built in with these services. And then on the other side of the spectrum, we have a, the, the serverless in which we have Lambda, of course, that we already talked about it. And, and, and when I see Lambda, it's, it's a compute service that provides a resizable compute capacity and, and actually simplify the life to the developers. So you can upload your code to the AWS Lambda and the service can run the code on your behalf using the AWS infrastructure. So AWS Lambda supports multiple coding languages like Node.js, Java, or Python. Yeah, um, maybe I can just add in there, you know, this is a spectrum. But I think what it, what it illustrates is what you get with AWS is choice. There's no such thing as one choice for all, all you know, systems. They need, you, need, you need as many choices as you can get. And our customers are asking us for these choices. So you can go all the way from bare metal on the far left to event-driven compute on the far right. 
and everything in the middle. And I think you'll just see this continue to expand. For example, you know, we're here to talk about serverless today. You can now run uh, EKS, which is managed Kubernetes in Fargate, which is a serverless container platform. So that's something that our customers have asked us for and is now available. So you're gonna see this, this choice continue to grow over time. Yeah, that's perfect. Thank you, Paul. So yeah, that's in terms of compute, but we also have the storage capabilities and we also have other AWS services like queuing and, and system notification system services. Yeah, another, another example on the storage layer is, is file storage, right? Especially for our Windows customers, they asked us for uh, Windows-based file storage systems that are fully managed and those are now available as well, right, on, on AWS along with your traditional, uh, you know, NFS type file storage systems and, you know, S3 storage, which is, you know, comes in many different varieties as well. Yeah. So then uh, moving uh, right along with the labs. Um, so we're going to use the Quip Labs uh, platform for running the lab. And, and this is type of uh, the recommendation that we have for you um, so we're gonna uh, send this information to you. Uh, we will recommend you to run uh, the introduction to DynamoDB, Lambda, and, and we're going to do today the Amazon API Gateway. Um, but later, this lab over here, it's more advanced intermediate lab in which includes uh, Amazon DynamoDB and Amazon Kinesis Streams with Lambda. Uh, we're going to share some credits with you so you can run the labs by yourself. Um, so you can uh, either just watch uh, the demo or feel free to, to run in parallel this lab. Uh, we're going to use the, um, the Quib Lab platform. And just to talk a little, a little bit about Quib Labs, this is a hands-on lab and online learning environment that comes with a set of instructions to to walk you through a live real world and scenario based use cases. And this is actually a, a, a sandbox account uh, that you can run all of these uh, uh, AWS services. Uh, so if you uh, go to quilllabs.com, uh, you can create an account and we're going to send you instructions about it. And, and then uh, you actually can type uh, uh, like in a search a introduction to Amazon API Gateway. And um, we selected this lab. Uh, it's it's a, a straightforward, but also a, a, we want to show you how to make a RESTful API Gateway endpoint um, that it's going to invoke a Lambda function and return some JSON all the way back to the client. And that's actually some of the components that Leon is playing in the re-architecting strategy. Uh, the other thing I'd like to mention, is that AWS actually has a team that updates all of those labs. And as you can see, this lab, it's pretty up to date, 2020 lab. Uh, and you will have all the set of instruction walking you through the services and actually the lab itself. In this case, for this demo, uh, so we're going to create a simple FAQ microservice, and then it will return a JSON object containing a random question and an answer pair using an Amazon API gateway in point that invokes a Lambda function. So if we take a closer look to the diagram, uh, let me zoom out a little bit. Uh, so that's, that's very straightforward, and it will use a, a, the microservice architecture uh, what we're gonna do is create a Lambda function. Uh, and actually, we're going to, this is um, um, the Amazon Lambda frequently I answer and questions. We're gonna copy and paste this, and then we're going to tell the Lambda code to show randomly one of those answer questions. That's very straightforward, but the idea is a how simple you can create an integration with customers, how a Amazon API gateway can work at the front end uh, uh, and your front door and they how easily you can integrate with Lambda function. The other thing I want to mention 
it's when you take a look to API Gateway, there are many other functionalities like Leon explained. Uh, for example, if you want to provide authentication, you can easily take this Amazon API and create a relationship, for example, with Amazon Cognito or if you know, with a AWS Amplify or with any other service like RDS. So I just want to show you at a high level how this works and, and uh, uh, so yeah. you can see the, 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 the serverless architecture. Yeah, go ahead. Oh. I, I think also, Carlos, just to point out, with Lambda and API, they're, they're fully integrated, meaning they work together and they're aware of each other. And there are actually 47 integrations with other AWS services that are native for Lambda. So, you know, the, the point there is they're, they're meant to work together in a, in a decoupled architecture. And there's 47 services and growing that, that are, you know, aware of each other, for lack of a better term. It, yeah. Just as an example of one customer that is using API Gateway and Lambda is, is T-Mobile. I don't know if you guys are familiar with the large uh, wireless service provider. They've uh, integrated Lambda and API Gateway into a lot of their application architectures and are able to, uh, it's allowed them to dramatically lower their operational costs while increasing their ability to uh, develop new applications in a, in a faster manner. So it's just one example. I'll try to point out some others along the way. Okay, perfect. Thank you, Paul. Uh, yeah, those are very useful. Uh, so the, the other thing I, I would add about Lambda, so when I see Lambda uh, at a high level, I can see an event-driven compute service where AWS Lambda runs your code in response to events, such as one example might be uploading an image files in an S3 bucket. And the other way, it's a, again a compute service that run a code in response to HTTP requests. And in this case, we can be using Amazon API Gateway. So this is basically what we're gonna do. Um, so uh, when you do the lab, you run the lab, and then there are a set of instruction. So again, we're going to create an AWS Lambda function, create an Amazon API Gateway endpoint, and then you will see some of the functionalities that Leon was talking about. So CloudWatch metrics, uh, some monitoring components that actually are built in, in the AWS console. And this is something that I really love about AWS. When you are in the normal a, a data center environment, you need to then start looking into third party tools for monitoring uh, uh, like syslog, SNMP, and, and, and with uh, uh, AWS, you have a built-in CloudWatch solution that you can uh, easily take a look to many metrics and, and, and it's actually built-in with the service itself. So we're gonna go ahead and open the AWS console and I will put the instructions aside. Uh, but feel free to um, to run this uh, uh, by yourself. So yeah, the first step, uh, the first task that we have, it's uh, for people that are not familiar with the AWS console, uh, it looks like this. So on the right side, you have the region, you have the AWS account. In this case, because we're using a Quib Labs, Quib Labs provision, a sandbox account for us with an AWS student account. Um, um, and then you have a, a, on the corner here, all the services. So here, as you can see, AWS has been increasing over the last 20 years, uh, many services around server, serverless, analytic, analytics, security. So there, there are a wide range of services that you can use that fit for your specific workload and your specific application. Yeah, I would just I point out that there are 23 regions that are currently available for AWS. As you can see, we're using Oregon region and there are 73 availability zones inside of those 23 regions. So basically for this conversation, you can think of an availability zone as like a uh, disparate data center and a region will have multiple availability zones that are set up in a highly available fashion. And you know, we're gonna, the pace of innovation continues. 
you're going to see 12 new availability zones have been announced. Those are the kind of the inside of a region. And we have four new regions that are, are coming online, including one in Cape Town that I believe just opened uh, this month. Yeah, and if you want, that, that's a very good point, Paul. If you want to see that information in real time, you can go to infrastructure.aws and you will see all the region availability zones, local zones, uh, POC, all the network, AWS backbone network uh, that it's available right now. It's incredible. I can tell you that is the highest and more reliable uh, cloud computing network in the world right now. One of the reasons why partners like Jellicos use AWS is because uh, you know the experience we have in building these clouds and in and, and the, and the cloud environment, and you know the scale allows us to experience things that some other companies just haven't experienced yet. Uh, so you know that that experience is uh, not something that you can recreate. And you know what we say is there's no compression algorithm for the experience, and what that means for customers like you is our ability to grow and and add is is based on you know that that experience. Right. Yeah. So uh, moving moving along with the lambda, um, so we will go to the services and then. Um, then type AWS Lambda, and this is actually the AWS uh, Lambda console. Uh, the first step that we're going to do, it's create a Lambda function. Um, and then we go right to the corner, and then we have three ways to create the Lambda function. One of the most common one is use the blueprints, and the blueprints are a code template for greeting Lambda functions, and those it provide a, like an, a standard Lambda for triggers, such as creating an Alexa skills and processing Amazon Kinesis Firehose. So you'll see some of the examples that can be used with other AWS uh, 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 services. Then uh, for this lab, we're going to use the author from scratch because the code is very simple. So we're gonna write down the code. So. Moving with the lab, we're going to uh, just uh, write a name here, and the name of this function uh, will be FAQ. Uh, uh, following the instruction with Quib Labs, uh, they recommend to do Node.js uh, 12.x. Then we're going to choose or create an existing role. In that case, uh, Quib Labs already created a role for us and for people that don't understand roles in the identity access management, a, a security is actually job zero for AWS. And, and, and in order to leverage any service or in order to make Lambda to work with any other AWS service, there should be a role that is an identity that is associated with a policy that allow you to invoke or to run all our services. So in that case, we have a Lambda basic execution role. Yeah, I would just, I would just point out, you know, with, with Lambda, there are customers like Fannie Mae and FICO and Thomson Reuters and, and many, many others that are using Lambda functions in their application stacks. And like you pointed out, Carlos, security is job one here at, at AWS and you can achieve you know, FedRAMP, PCI, and HIPAA compliance with your workloads on AWS. You know, things like ISO 20, uh, 27017 and 18, the SOC 1, 2, and 3 compliance, and many other uh, uh, certifications are possible using patterns like that include Lambda and API Gateway. Hey, Paul, we got a quick question here. So on the chat, uh, when you say AWS is, is adding four regions or that there are 73 region uh, availability zones, how does that affect my organization? Uh, in other words, what decisions am I making based on this as I create or design my solution? Yeah, understand. So one, one area when you're adding availability zones and regions that you want to take into consideration is your networking and your CIDR block address to make sure that you build out for additional growth. 
because you're going to continue to see regions being added. Uh, the other thing that you want to think about is where are your customers located and how do you, hand, how do you uh, uh, plan on delivering content to them? So integration with the content distribution network, either using the AWS one, which is CloudFront, or a third-party vendor like Akamai, or one of those is, is possible. So it really depends on what, is your, what are the requirements of your customers and your workload, and then uh, you know, design for that. Uh, the, the interface that you're gonna have with AWS is always gonna look the same. So we're building in Oregon. If you wanna build in you know, Sao Paulo, you literally click into the other region. There are some services that are region specific and there are some services that are global. It just depends on, on the service. So it really gets into conversation that we've had a lot around, you know, how do you build something in a well-architected model? And it's something that we can definitely uh, dive deep and something that Jellicoast does with our customers, right? Which is look at a workload and, and review it in a well-architected manner and then deploy it on AWS. Right, yeah, exactly. The, the other thing I would add, I think network is very important, uh, uh, but the other thing is our, uh, the services itself. So based on the organization's priorities and um, um, services that they want to utilize, uh, then they can select the region. One example of this is uh, workspaces. So workspaces might be available in some of the regions of AWS. It's not available for all of them. Um, 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 that's one cr criteria that we see organization using for selecting the region. Uh, and the other thing is that anything is greeting in stone. So AWS is releasing and updating services every time. And if today you are in, in, Northern, in North Virginia and you want to create a backup in Ohio or you want to create a multi-region approach, that's super straightforward. And, and with infrastructure as a code, it's even easier to make the hub. Yeah, maybe I'll just point out one other thing that I think is important to note about AWS. Most customers find that they can meet RTO and RPO objectives by running an application in a single region on AWS. There are examples where multiple region applications do exist, but the, you have to weigh the complexity and regions and availability zones are different on AWS and they might be in other providers. So it's just, a, it's just a, something to you know, dig into a little bit and we're happy, Jellicoast would be happy to discuss that with you. Yeah, perfect. So moving along with the lab, uh, um, so we create the, the Lambda function um, um, and, and then we have different options here. And now, so we have a designer uh, area that we're gonna use later, but as I said right now in the function code, we're going to follow the instructions on the lab and we're gonna copy, so we're gonna delete this and paste the code actually provided for the lab. As you can see, the code is very straightforward. Uh, so we all, uh, this is a JSON and we only copy and paste the questions that we got from Lambda. And then what this is doing, it's basically every time that uh, we get uh, the, uh, this event driven, we're going to show a random answer uh, and question. So then um, we can go and probably click save. Then we, if we scroll down, we can see uh, some basic settings. So we edit this, we can have the description here. Let's say uh, provide a random FAQ if you want. And then you have other uh, things that, that you want to, that you can actually change. Then if we, uh, in this designer, area, uh, we can add a trigger. So this trigger is what AWS service or non-AWS service is going to trigger this AWS Lambda function. As you can see here, there are plenty and easy integration with other with AWS services like Kinesis, DynamoDB, Cognito. But if we scroll down, there are a wide range of third-party tools 
like monitoring systems, authentication systems. You can see here some example of New Relic, Datadog, those are monitoring systems. You see PagerDuty. So it's a, a, a Lambda and AWS has a great ecosystem and, uh, when in terms of relationship with other third party tools and, and services. So in this case, we're going to um, do it with a native AWS service, API Gateway. And in this case, we don't have an API gateway, so we're going to create a, an API gateway. And we're going to use a REST API. Uh, so uh, just a little bit of background, a API gateway has two types of APIs. So you can have RESTful APIs and you, have, you can have WebSock API. Um, then in the security, I will leave it open here for now. Um, Yeah, there are, might be additional um, settings. So we will provide the name and for the development, probably I pull my development or deployment. And I think that will be it. So we can go ahead and add this trigger. So basically what we have done here, it's tell the Lambda that every time that we get an HTTPS get to the API gateway, we're going to run that code. And that's that's basically it. So that's 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 type of the lag. Now what we're going to do as the task two, it's a, a test this Lambda function. So uh, here below, you will see the Amazon API gateway. And, and one of the things that we get it's the URL. So that's the URL of this API gateway and we can just click on, on this. And um, hello Lambda. Um, if we just refresh, we should be able, well, let me see one thing here. We can go to Lambda. And safe. Yeah, as you can see when we start refreshing uh, and we hit the uh, API gateway endpoint URL, we see uh, that it's working perfectly the code. So it's showing randomly any answer and question. Of course, you can see this ugly a uh, URL here, but on top of this, you can use Amazon Route 53 and make it a, a better a, a DNS name uh, for your application. The other way that you can test this, so that's that's basically the, the way you wanna see it, but AWS Lambda also provides you a way to test this application without actually going to the browser. So we can go ahead and create a test. So we can configure a test event. And we're going to uh, say, okay, the, this is going to be test one or test API gateway. I'll put test one. And then uh, you can provide some specific key values here. We're not gonna provide anything right now as part of this lab. So let me just delete this and delete this. So we're going to save, we're going to create this test event and a, 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 you can create as many tests as you want and then you can select the test event and then click on test. So when you click click on, on test here, you will get some execution result. You will see the success result here. And then you have many other details about what it, it was displayed. You see the direction or the time uh, that the, the code took to, to run. In this case is 29 milliseconds. 
and you get any other information. And that's good when it's successful, but if I change the code and I break the code and I run this test again, you will see uh, 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 more details on the errors here. And, and we can easily make that as well. So uh, with that being said, the, the other component that we have, it's actually the monitoring component. Um, so you can either go to Amazon CloudWatch, that is the monitoring component, or uh, we can uh, go here um, in, inside the AWS Lambda, you will see all the CloudWatch metrics that are already built in with um, uh, the Lambda functions itself. So you will see invocations, uh, directions, any error or count or success rates that you might have. Uh, and if you want to take a closer look, you can actually open the CloudWatch console. And CloudWatch just um, for people new to AWS, it's the a monitoring tool that we have for many of the AWS services, either for EC2 instance, that for BPC, for site-to-site -site VPN. So you can create your logs and you will have logs related to a specific service. So if you click on these logs, Lambda is actually ingesting in real time logs to CloudWatch and you will be able to see when a request was started or was ended and what happened. So you will get all of those information. This is not only for visualizing real time, one of the things that I love of AWS is all the integration that I have. So I don't only have the logs, but I also have all capabilities of, of creating events, creating rules, creating alarms, and I can define alarms based on specific roles and then notify, integrate that with a Amazon a system notification system and integrate that with my pager duty or by, uh, with my monitoring system on-prem or any other cloud-based monitoring system. Um, um, let's see here. We also have some metrics. Uh, as you can see, those metrics uh, might be for API Gateway, for Lambda, for EBS volumes, EC2 instance. So that's all the the functionalities that we have with CloudWatch. Anything you would, you, would you like to add, Paul? No, I think you covered it well from a, from a, for this demo. I would say you know, CloudWatch, monitor, CloudTrail, audit, right? So right. you can have fine-grained controls that allow you to monitor your systems and also audit. audit is, auditing is done through CloudTrail, Monitoring is done through CloudWatch. Correct. Yeah. And they're fully integrated with third party tools like Sumo Logic, uh, Splunk, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, exactly. And, and the other thing I will add about CloudWatch is this is a tool for ingesting logs, uh, not only from AWS, but also from your on premises. So we have seen other organizations that can use CloudWatch and all the integration system CloudWatch has for ingesting logs coming actually from on-premises or from any IoT device that you might have based on your application. So uh, with that being said, uh, we completed this lab successfully. Uh, this is the conclusion. So um, as you can see, this is a 55 minutes lapse, but we did it in 20 minutes. So you, we successfully and easily uh, created the, the, that RESTful API and we see actually the integration of the Amazon API gateway to Lambda function uh, 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 having the JSON code back to the client. So with that being said, um, um, I will open um, the floor to have any answer or any question that you have about serverless or about AWS in general. Carlos, I'll take a look at the uh, the chat here. Um, okay. As Carlos mentioned at the very beginning, when you get to the labs, the, the beauty of it is you can actually walk step by step through the 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 lab uh, documentation, and it'll actually help you walk step by step through the lab. And um, you know, Carlos has clearly done this multiple times, so he's able to kind of jump around. But you know, if you're new to this type of Quick Labs 
uh, set up, you can actually just walk through the directions and complete the lab on your own. And usually the time allowed for these labs is, is plenty of time for you to complete it. All right. All right, let me check. Uh, looks like we don't have any additional uh, questions at this point. So Carlos and Paul, thank you for your time. Um, we will kind of include you guys in the wrap up here later, but I think we're gonna pivot with about 10 minutes left to get into our quiz so that we can win fabulous prizes. So um, Jess, I'll have you kind of jump in and, and help run this from, from here on out. Sounds great, thank you, Kyle. All right, everyone, we're just gonna do a little quiz uh, to wrap up just for some fun and to uh, see how much you've retained from the presentation today. <laughs> um, so I'm gonna go ahead and launch our quiz application, which is Kahoot. Um, and it will show you instructions on screen for how you can log in. Um, I find the easiest way to do this is on your phone. Um, so if you see the uh, instructions up top here, you should be able to log in. And when I see we've got players joined, I'll go ahead and launch the quiz. Okay. Yeah, we'll give you guys a couple minutes to log into Kahoot. Uh, tell, tell everybody what they're playing for, Jess. Uh, we are playing for a couple of uh, $25 Amazon gift cards. So with all of us being at home, it's a great time to shop from home. Yeah. And Mother's Day is coming up, everybody. You might want to use it there. I feel like a game show host. There you go. Oh, we got one. Tom's in. Hi. Tom, you got a 100% chance of winning a gift card right now. <laughs> yeah. The odds are in your favor. Uh, Ted. Excellent. Thank you. Scott, thank you. All right, I think we may have one or two more to join in here and then we'll get started, Jess. All right. Well, let's run with let's run with these three. I like the odds for these guys. Looking good. All right. Here we go. How many regions does AWS have? That's kind of a trick question because I think the Milan one just opened today from that's not mistaken. Ah. ah. Three, nice. Oh, now it's how fast you answer is going to help your points. How many availability zones does AWS have? Wow. Ooh. All right. Quick that time. That was quick. Well, Scott, still in the lead. What provides the information required to launch an EC2 instance? Amazon machine image, correct answer. One person got that right. And it good. good. I think Tom moved up there in the rankings. Which application migration strategy refers to lift, tinker, and ship? One person got it right, replatform. Right. Scott's on fire. Yep, nice. 
Which application migration strategy refers to cloud native? Nice. Hey, people. Which AWS service allows you to deploy code without managing servers? Ooh. Great job, everybody. Scott is literally on fire. Yep. We now have flames. What is a pattern to gradually create a new system around the edges of the old growing over time? Nice. Everybody's paying attention. That's positive. It is. That's good. You guys are doing great. I heard some actual flames. That's awesome. breakaway here uh oh Tom moved up <laughs> which AWS service is a key value and document database service nice. very yeah. nice last question oh, first and second get prizes there we go What are all of the languages that AWS Lambda support? You can bring your own language too, but we'll, we'll save that for another day. <laughs> all right. Here we go. Ted, congrats. Very nice. Tom, um, gift card, and the winner. Yes, ah, Great job, Scott. Uh. Okay, so, so what we'll do is, uh, as we said at the very beginning, we will send out information that includes the, the deck on Strangler Pattern. Uh, we'll send out additional information that you need to run the labs, um, including some credits so you can, can run them at your own pace. Um, we'll send out our contact information. If you have questions, feel free to reach out and let us know what we can do to help. And then uh, Jess will grab the email addresses that you guys registered with uh, to get you the gift cards. And uh, we were wrapping up here a couple minutes early. Uh, anybody else on the panel have any other comments before we wrap here? I just say, if, you know, because this is new, right, we're all in a new format here, Kyle. Uh, I appreciate Jellico's putting this together and running it uh, on behalf of our mutual customers. If you guys have feedback for us so we can really get this uh, improved for next time even more, uh, very interested in that as well. So on behalf of AWS, thank you, Jellico's and my, our customers for hanging in there with us on this. You bet. Thank you. All right, everybody. Have a great rest of your day. Have a good weekend. We appreciate your time and uh, let us know if we can help you. Take care.